jaded. Do you all know what that means? Have you ever gotten involved in something and it was exciting and you enjoyed it and maybe it was a popular thing to do and you got involved in it and you did it and you did it and you did it and eventually it's like, eh, let's do something else. Well, I thought you were really involved in this. Well, I am, but the new wears off. It's jaded. My heart breaks, and I'm going to try to keep my eyes from running over this morning like they've already done a time or two. I posted something on Facebook yesterday, and I'm going to read it again this morning in something that I was reading, but my story is probably not that different than a lot of yours. I've told you before how when I was probably 11 years old, I came to Christ. And I was baptized. And I was fascinated. I, I wanted to know more about the Lord. And as I went into high school, those of you that knew me then, I was diligent. And I sought God. And I studied my Bible. And I went to church any time the doors were open. And I looked for opportunities. And there was a group of us that did that. And at that age, when I looked at the people that were our age now, and I saw them living like most of the churches living today, there was a heavy burden in my heart thinking, what happened to them? Don't they know what the Bible says? Don't they know that God says, I'll never leave you nor forsake you? But now they're grown, and they're worried to death about this, and they're worried to death about that. He's drinking. She's crying all the time. She's on depress antidepressants. As a, as a kid, I say a kid, and I've got to be careful there. Because, you know, many times when revival has swept across this globe, it's been led by the Holy Spirit through people sometimes in their 19, 20, 21 years old. What's happened? The message I have this morning is for everybody. Because for you younger people, don't you think that this isn't going to happen to you? And for those of you that are my age and older, around my age, we've got to wake back up. We've got to wake back up. When I was a kid in high school, there was a song by a guy, some of you will be familiar with his name, Keith Green. And he wrote this one song, and listen to the words of it. My eyes are dry. My faith is old. My heart is hard. My prayers are cold. And I know how I ought to be. Alive to you and dead to me. But what can be done for an old heart like mine? Soften it up with oil and wine. The oil is you. Your spirit of love. Please wash me anew with the wine of your blood. I was talking to Sally earlier this week and I said sometimes I, I, when we were on the radio we could talk to people all over. It didn't matter how many people but I wouldn't stand in front of people. I would not. That's something that God has done. He put in me. And now... <clears throat> If I'm speaking the word of God, I don't care if I'm in a stadium and it's packed. I would love that. But something has happened. And I tell you about it all the time. The, the new creation, I, I've come to realize it's there. But I'm starving inside for it to go on. And I understand that I'll be 63 next Saturday. I said next Saturday. Last week I was off. Week I'm old. I get them mixed up. But I'll be 63. And I understand that sometimes I get hopping up here and hollering and screaming and I get so fired up and, I, and I, I, sometimes I feel a little funny because I look at other preachers and I don't see a whole lot of that and I realize, what's the deal? But listen, in my heart, I feel like I'm 18 years old again. And my heart says, this is true. And every word in here for healing broken hearts and for freeing prisoners, it's all true. And it's the same as it's ever been. And I'll give anything to have that again. To be able to free people. 
to go to the jails and to speak life into them, to go to the homeless people and tell them this is not all there is. This will end shortly, but keep your eyes on the prize because it's real. Many of you had that when you were kids, and it's not there anymore. My eyes are dry. God doesn't want that. And it's not something that a finger's pointed at you because it's happened over and over and over in generation after generation. And I found myself the last two weeks crying out to God in my prayer time. Lord, I'm at all I want for my birthday. The only thing I want is I turn 63 is an anointing like a 63-year-old man has never had. I want, Lord, a boldness and an effectiveness. I want to be able to speak the Word of God. And whether people ever remember me or my name, I want them to, uh, on the radio, anywhere we can reach, I just want them to hear the truth and sense the reality of the living God and find the freedom and the victory that Christ died and was separated from the Father to bring us. He didn't do all of that. I'm going to tell you again what I've told you before. All my life I thought the horror of being on the cross, I always thought the passion of Jesus was the fact that, think of this, man, that they actually drove spikes in him and that he hung there and drowned for breath because he eventually was fatigued and couldn't live. I always thought that was what he did. That's what he did, but many men have been crucified. Many men have suffered physically. That's not what saved your soul. That was a price paid for your sin. But when Jesus cried on the cross, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He wasn't saying, Why have you allowed them to do this to me? That's not what he was saying at all. It was at that very moment that he took all of our sin... All sin, every child molester, every rapist, every murderer, everybody in the filth and the wickedness that every man has ever done and ever will do was dumped on him. And it wasn't only dumped on him. He became that sin. 2 Corinthians 5.21 He made him who knew no sin be sin so we could be the righteousness of God, not so we could have a golden fish on the back of our black BMW. Why have we gone so far away from that? He did that to take us back to the garden. And most of us knew that at one time. But as we get older, and the devil keeps showing new things and shiny things and pretty things and aspiring things and goals and, and all these things I'm going to become, I'm going to be. God wants me to have my dream. That's just not biblical. God had a dream. And He paid the ultimate price that we could just bathe ourselves in His will. And you will never, I'll repeat, you will never find the satisfaction and the goal hunting you're thinking you're going to find until you find it from your Creator. Amen. I thought I was supposed to be a great radio entertainer and do morning shows, and I thought I would eventually make it into major markets and do this, that, and the other. And I was groomed for it, and all the way along, it, it was going right along. God was preparing me to be on my knees putting socks on swollen feet at a nursing home and learning to preach. And I never found greater satisfaction. I'm not a star. I'm not a, I'm a son of the Most High God. And I'd never change it. I'd never change it. And most of you have felt that calling in your heart when you were saved. And if you were saved as an adult, you heard it and it stirs in you. But you think, I can't do that. I'm grown. I'm grown. I've got kids. I've got a job. I've got a career. That... That very thing I just said, I'm grown, I have responsibilities, I have, I have bills, I have a retirement to look at. That's the very things that when we were kids following Christ, we looked at the older people and said, don't you know what Jesus said? But now that we have those things, what Jesus said must have meant something different. Let me find another translation and see if it's a little better. God has more. It's never changed. Stephen, if you were reading with us on our nightly Bible reads, 
He was a young man. They think he may have been between 17 and 21 years old. First deacon of the church. A deacon means a servant. He was there to serve the tables and take care of people and make sure that everybody, he was there to clean the church and to take care of the lawn and to, to do this, that, and the other and to make sure that everything was cared for so that the teachers and the preachers could stay on top of the word of God and worship and minister. And it says he was filled with power. He was a servant in the church. And yet he was filled with the power of God. And it said when he was challenged by the Sadducees and the Pharisees, at one point they looked on his face and it said this as though they were looking at the face of an angel. God caused him to have a glow about him that they couldn't even deny. And he was young. And he was eventually put to death. And as he was dying, as they're stoning him, young boy, he said, forgive them, Father, they don't know what they're doing. Now listen, here's how it's supposed to be. We get this fire when we're young. And we get saved. And all the world is not going to change what God has done for me. And the way it's supposed to go, as you get older, you get stronger. And as you go through this, you get stronger. And as you lose this and it breaks your heart, you get stronger. That's the only way that it's supposed to be, and it's not. Hasn't been most of through the Old Testament when you read about the kings. Josiah, one of the greatest kings that ever lived. First made a king when he was eight. He changed everything in Israel. He destroyed all of the idols. No more Super Bowls. <laughs> no, he didn't say that. But he wiped away all of the idols, and he put them away, and he was God's own servant. And yet, before he died, the Bible says that he had a disease in his feet and he sought every doctor in the land and never called upon the Lord and he died with it. Getting older. Today we have the Holy Spirit living in us. It doesn't have to be that way. If you want the Holy Spirit living in you, all you have to do is become saved. But do you know what? Here's the old message that I preach every week. Until you start to act on the truth that he is in you, you're going to live just like you've always lived. No, correct that. You're going to keep going backwards. Because you're going forward or backwards. Now, this book I was reading, I want you to listen to this and picture it. This was a group, these men, Bill Bright was a name that I recognized in here. And Richard Halverson is, is the story that this is being told about. But they were very young. I had been reading about the man named Richard Halverson. He was, uh, he was 19 when the Lord started this work in his life. And at this point, he's probably 22 or 23 years old. Now it says, follow me here. Please indulge me and listen carefully to what I read. Because if you want to know a closeness to God, I want you to hear every word. In 1947, Henrietta Mears, Bill Bright... Richard Halverson and Lewis Evans Jr. had a powerful supernatural encounter with the Holy Spirit. That night, they, now they, again, these are kids. These are young, young people. That night, they made a pact and they wrote a pledge to make their whole lives dedicated and expendable for the purposes of God. They put their flag in the ground. They put their flag in the ground and hell or high water will not move this. And they made a pact. They didn't just decide it. They got other people around them and they said, let's do this. Let's do this. They referred to their commitment as the fellowship of the burning heart. And their lifelong pledge reads as follows. Four things. There are four things. Listen to this and tell me if you can hold on to one of them. You can, but tell me if you do. Because this convicts me so. Here's the first one. This is their commitment. This is the pact they made. I am committed to the principle that Christian discipleship is sustained solely by God alone through His Spirit. That the abiding life that we talk about in John 15, I'm the vine, you're the branch, is His way of sustaining me. Therefore, listen, I pledge myself to a disciplined devotional life in which I promise through prayer Bible study and devotional reading to give God not less than one continuous hour per day. Every day, 
Every day, these young people said, for the rest of my life, and they did, for the rest of my life, I will spend at least one continuous hour. I'll not, not 50 minutes here and 10 minutes here and 8 minutes here. And I, it, yeah, I'll spend an hour. One hour. I will sit down and I will do nothing but pray, read my Bible and devotionals, and get closer to God. They committed. And they committed with each other, the four of them. And it swept over hundreds and thousands of other young people. Number two. I'm committed to the principle that Christian discipleship begins with Christian character. Therefore, I pledge myself to holy living that by a life of self-denial and self-discipline, I may emulate those Christ-like qualities of chastity and virtue which magnify the Lord. You won't catch me screaming and hollering at a ball game. I'm not saying there's anything. I don't even have to go into that. You know what I'm saying. You hear my heart. You won't catch me laughing, slapping people on a joke, and telling jokes and all this stuff when I'll pledge that I will walk in the character of Jesus Christ the rest of my life. Calling one another, the four of them, hold me to this, hold me to this. Number three, I am committed to the principle that discipleship, all of this is about being a disciple, and that's what we're all called to be. I am committed to the principle that discipleship exercises itself principally in the winning of lost souls to Christ. Don't answer me, but when's the last time each of you has even invited someone to come to church Sunday with you? Don't, don't, don't say anything, because I know some have. But even invited someone to come to church and try to fill these pews. Much less, when's the last time that you shared your faith with someone and asked them if they would like to know a personal relationship with Christ? We wonder why the church is dwindling. Because the church isn't bringing people into the church. Therefore, I, therefore I pledge myself to seek every possible opportunity to witness and to witness at every possible opportunity. Did you get that? I pledge myself to seek any possible opportunity to witness and to witness at every possible opportunity to the end that I may be responsible for bringing at least one to Christ every 12 months. Just one a year. Do that. You can do this. You can say, that's it. And find someone else and say, let's do this together. Let's do this together. And if you make this pact and you start committing to these things and telling God, basically, this all sounds so dramatic, but if I just read you a bunch of this, you'd get the same thing. But this happened in 1947. If we follow these things, your life is going to change. And you're going to find sin falling off. And you're going to find that you're going to say, that I can't do this. I made a commitment. I made a commitment to my brother here. I made a commitment to my sister. We have to have that thing in the flesh because we seem like it's not big enough or strong enough to realize I made a commitment to the one who became sin so I could be the righteousness of God in Christ. That's okay. If you have to do it this way to get it done, let's get on board. Listen to the last one. I am committed to the principle that Christian discipleship demands nothing less than absolute consecration to Christ. Some of this is like, Terry, that's a little radical. Well, you're following a man that gave his life for you for crying out loud. Lord. He died on the cross. Thank you, brother. He suffered and died and became the filth so we could be washed clean we were supposed to have looked at all of these things when we came to Christ. We were supposed to be told, if you're coming to Christ and you're looking for this eternal life and you're looking for this new victorious life in Christ, you give up your whole life. Your whole life. Remember that? 2 Corinthians 5, 17. All things are, old, old things are gone. All things are new. That, <laughs> that means what it says. It means my old ways are gone. And I would say, how can they say that? Or what does that really mean? Except I call you to witness God has worked this and he's working it daily in my life. I'm just not who I used to be. The music, the pastimes, the, the fun, the thing, the, 
the things that are used to, it's just I'm, it's different it's all different all the aspirations have changed I, I have totally different desires for things money's not one of them anymore just enough to do the things that he gives me to want to do I'll tell you as God is my witness if you gave Sally and me an $8,000 vacation to Hawaii today, we would find a way to cash that thing in and get this radio time paid for. And put it back in here. Test me. <laughs> Give me that money and watch. Write it out in my name and watch it go right back here. The things, it's, all things have become new. Because listen, you all know this. I'm not telling you like, look at me. I'm telling you like, this is who we are. This is what we're supposed to be about because, listen, since the last five weeks, every Saturday, Sally and I have buried someone and done a funeral. I'm telling you, it's just like this. What makes you think you're going to live forever? When are we going to do the things that he's called us to do? And when are we going to become the victorious soldiers that he's called us to be? I'm telling you this in the name of Jesus and all of you listening on the radio and those of you who are online, I'm telling you right now, the principalities and the powers of hell are shaking, scared to death. One of you are going to take what I'm saying and walk in it. Because if you do, all hell will be shaken. Jesus told his disciples when he asked them, who do they say I am? And one of them said, well, some of them say you're Elijah, come back. Some of them say you're John the Baptist raised from the dead. And Jesus said, well, who do you say I am? Peter said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus looked at him. Jesus looked at Peter and he said, I'm giving you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you loose here will be loosed in the heavenlies around you. And whatever you bind up here, we have those. And do you know what they are? The Lord showed me this in my walks. It's the words that come out of your mouth. And those words have to come from the heart. When you walk, when you walk a life and you speak the word of God and the people you speak it to see you live the word of God, the heavenlies are opened and God is seen again. This is waiting on us, y'all. I'm not telling you about a huge chest buried out here in the lawn full of gold that we have to find and dig up i'm telling you it's right here it's right here all you have to do is come bury your hands in it and start living in it it's yours he said therefore i present my body a living sacrifice utterly abandoned to god Utterly abandoned to God. Romans 12, 1 is where he got it. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable. Holy and acceptable. That means, if you're still nipping a little on the side, stop it. If you're still watching dirty shows, stop it. You are clean. God has cleansed you. If there's sin in your life, any sin that's in the Scripture and you're still doing, cry out to God and say, Deliver me. Deliver me, Lord. It's like a fish hook because it hurt when it went in, but now getting it out is going to be deathly. Help me, Lord. Help me because I want this. I want this. Lord, I thought I wanted this and I thought I wanted this. The devil got me again. But I'm asking you, to save me one more time Lord he will remember the prodigal you're not going to tax his grace never will you tax his grace with repentance we have a holy life to live by this commitment I will that God's perfect will shall find complete expression in my life and I offer myself in all sobriety to be expendable for Christ expendable you know what that means I've got a hundred dollars 20 of it is expendable whatever anybody it's here use it use it, it says our whole life should be expendable that's when hit my preacher hit myself here 
We've preached three sermons at the jail. We've gone and ministered to the shut-ins. We've gone and ministered to somebody else, and we're literally exhausted. And we get home and sit down in our chair, and a doorbell rings. It's yours, Lord. It's yours. You've got to give me the strength because I can't do this, but I'm asking you to. I don't have a right for this thing. I don't have a right to get all upset over it. I still work with that sometimes, but God's taken me. I challenge you in the name of Jesus to say what I've been telling the folks at the jail. And I'm going to tell you again. My job as the pastor is to lead away and show you the word of God. Not as a superior being. I'm just a few steps ahead where you're supposed to go. And I keep going and you keep following. Some of you will overtake me. And as I get older, you'll be able to take the position and I'll sit down. That's how I'm not. I'm not something different and greater than you. God just put me here to say, follow, follow. Come on, I'll show you. I'm reading this, I'll show you. Now you follow me and watch. You see me do it and see me fall and see me make it. And then you do it. That's my job. And I stand before God and I cry out for that holiness. And here's what I tell the guys at the jail and I'll tell you. Next time you see me at Walmart. Next time you see me at Sutherland's, wherever. Duck back behind the end aisle. Don't let me see you. Follow me around. And see how I live. You are no better Christian than you are at home when somebody's lost something of yours in the house that you need. You're no better Christian than you are when you're late for work and somebody pulls out in front of you on the highway. That's your Christianity. Holy life expendable 24-7. And I'm here to tell you it's doable. Not in our flesh. You'll never do it. You'll never accomplish it in your flesh. Only by the living Holy Spirit. Again, who already lives in you. Ephesians 1.3 We have been blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places through Christ Jesus. Romans 8.9 The Spirit of Christ dwells in you. If any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he's none of his. This morning, I'm going to ask some of you to make a commitment again. I'm going to ask you to make this commitment. Go back to that place in your life where you first came to Christ. And let somebody else know. Let somebody else know that's it. That's it. I've, I've got to, it's now or never. I've got to follow him. How do I know how much longer I'm going to live? How do I know how much longer I have to bring him glory? for what he did because I'm going to tell you something one of these days when we stand before Jesus Christ and we meet him all we're going to think when we see the beauty and when we see the magnitude of what he actually did for us to take away the filthy nature that was born in me when we see the magnitude of what he's did what he's done all we're going to want the only thing that will matter is how can I show my appreciation how can I show my appreciation and some of us will have Nothing to show him. That should put a cold chill in your heart. That's the casting crowns where the group got their name. My crowns, I'll cast. What crowns? Have you led people to Christ? Have you prayed the prayer of faith? Have you stood by the dying saint and kept their hearts strong in faith? That's crowns. Do you have anything to show him when he overwhelms you with his love and his goodness and his gentleness? Read what Paul said about it. He said, Fire will be put to everything you've ever done. And he said, some will have nothing left. The fire is his glory when we see. You're going to see this man someday, this God. And you will just, you will be enamored with what a glorious, wonderful, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Don't you want to have something to say? My drum, ba rum pa pum pum Here's my heart. Here's what I did. Here's who I am, Lord. I gave my life for you. I died because I wouldn't deny you and I was preaching your gospel. That's what the men and women of the Bible will be able to say. Well, I had a bumper sticker on my car, Lord. That's going to burn. He's calling you this morning. Come into the army. Come into the army. Let's stand. 
If you're saved, make this commitment today and make it with someone else. Tell them. Come forward if you want and let's pray together and let people know you've made this commitment. But move forward today and start gaining your crowns. Paul said, I'm going to receive the crown that's waiting for me and for all those who glory at His appearing. Because it's coming, guys. This day is coming. We've got to be prepared for it. I want to be. Lord, give me another opportunity. Put me in the fire so I can come out the other side. Give me another day of pure hell beating against me and let's see if I can come out the end of it praising and worshiping you. And if you've never received Christ or if you don't know, come now or text me. 685-5519. 685-5519 and I'll get back with you. Now is your time of invitation. If you want to make things right, you come now. Jesus.